Hey everybody, welcome back to another video in my materials informatics series. Today, we're gonna to talk about the machine learning tasks and types, right? There's different types of machine learning, there's different things that we ask them to do. I'm gonna go over some of the basic ones and the ones that I find useful. So let's get started with some essential definitions because machine learning, it gets used interchangeably with words like artificial intelligence, it gets used interchangeably with deep learning and all sorts of other things. So let's get a couple definitions in first. First off, when we talk about AI, artificial intelligence, here's the definition that I find for it. The theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, translation between languages, right? That's artificial intelligence. So anytime that you get the computer to do something that normally a human would have to do, artificial intelligence. Now machine learning is slightly different. Machine learning, the definition is the use and development of computer systems that are able to learn and adapt without following explicit instructions by using algorithms and statistical models to analyze and draw inferences from patterns in data. So again, that would be a subset of AI because again, AI is something that you're getting a, a computer to do that normally a human would have to do. Well, finding patterns and developing you know, approaches without being told the explicit instructions, that's something that a human would have to do. So it's a subset of AI. And therefore we can go further into the subset and get to deep learning. Deep learning is now a broader family of the machine learning methods that imitates the workings of the human brain in processing data and creating patterns for use in decision making. So it's just another type of machine learning where it's gonna try and find patterns in the data without being told how to do it. It's just that the technique whereby you do it with deep learning is meant to mimic how our brain works. And there's some pretty major differences, but that was at least the concept behind it. Now, <clears throat> that said, finding patterns in data is nothing new to scientists material scientists or otherwise. For example, take a look at this figure. Scientists have been noting, pa noticing patterns in data for a very long time. Here you see the boiling point and the melting point of different paraffin waxes as you increase the paraffin chain length, right? As you go from methane to ethane, propane, butane, all this, right? As you get it longer, scientists really early realized, hey, this curve sort of trends like that and it's pretty predictable. So predictable, in fact, that we could sort of put an equation to it. And now you've got this empirical relationship where maybe you didn't yet understand the first principles, you know, atomistic mechanisms on why the boiling point was increasing, but you could still use this as a model to predict, you know, if you've got that 20th, you know, chain length carbon, you'd be able to predict with pretty good accuracy what its boiling point or melting point would be using data like this. So again, scientists have been using patterns in data for a really long time. What's different about machine learning is the complexity of the patterns that we can capture in data. Here, this is a very simple one, and it's a really obvious trend. It's one target variable, the boiling point in this case, as a function of one uh, variable, the paraffin chain length. But what if you start to add all sorts of other things? What if you start to change the atoms in there? Or what if instead of long straight polymers, you do you know branched polymers, right? these different you know uh, geometrically different but chemically the same compounds, right? That gets really tricky. Um, so because of that, you could imagine that it starts to get harder and harder. And then you could throw in more and more and more variables or multiple targets. And all of a sudden, our human mind, it doesn't do a great job of capturing patterns in high dimensional space where there's lots of different variables to consider. But we can train algorithms, computers, to capture those trends with ease. And so that's what machine learning is going to do. Now, when you dive into the actual different types of machine learning, I find that the most common sort of view is something like this. You'll typically see a figure that looks a little bit like this, where they will divide it into four categories. You have your supervised machine learning, your unsupervised, your semi-supervised, and your reinforcement learning, right? That's the typical four types of machine learning that you will see talked about. So what are the differences between these broadly speaking? Well, in supervised learning versus unsupervised learning, the key difference is that you have labeled data. What do we mean by labeled data? Well, let's take it back to material science. Let's say I've got a paraffin wax and I know it's melting point. So because I know the target, let's say I'm trying to ultimately predict melting points. If I have an example where I know the melting point of one of those, that would be an example of a labeled data. Where instead, if I have some wax and I don't know what its melting point is, I, have, I, I don't know anything about it, just that it's a wax, this could be an example of unlabeled data, right? So the target variable is not available in unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, you do have it. Now, even there, you can have different branches, right? With melting point, it's really easy. You could say that for a bunch of different waxes, they all have different 
very uh, different melting points, but they're sort of continuous, right? They go from zero up to you know some high number, and it's this continuous range of melting points for different waxes. But that's not necessarily always the case. Some data is not sequential or continuous like that. Maybe it's categorical. For example, color, right? What if I'm saying for different metals, what's their color, or different materials, what's their color? I guess color is sort of on a continuous spectrum. Um, but we could say crystal structure type. Now it's not on a spectrum at all. It's very much just categorical. One is rock salt, one is FCC, one is HCP, right? Uh, it's just different categories, okay? But you can still have labeled data, okay? So depending on whether you had continuous data or categorical data changes the type of task that you might be interested in doing. If you had continuous data, data you might be interest, interested in doing a regression where for some you do a regression and now you can fit your data to that curve for this continuous data and for a new wax that comes in you'd be able to predict its melting point. Whereas for classification in comes a new material and you'd be able to predict its crystal structure or its color or you know whatever else and it's that its categorical variable is okay so these are examples that you very commonly see in the materials informatics literature you'll very commonly see property prediction from a continuous variable they're predicting strength they're predicting dielectric constant they're predicting you know some sort of materials property or if it's classification you will often see things like structure prediction taking place okay now, if you've got unsupervised learning, we can't do tasks like regression or classification, but we can do other tasks. So if you don't have the target available, you can still do things with your data. If you have a bunch of things, you could, for one, you could say, well, let's cluster them together. Let's take the things that look similar or are similar in some way or another and put them in one cluster and different things that are dissimilar and put them over here and we can cluster them. You can do association, you can do projection, you can do visualization. We'll have some examples of these in the next couple of slides. And there's been some examples of these things in the material science literature. For example, microstructure grouping. When you've got a bunch of SEM images and you want to figure out which ones all came from the same sorts of materials, you can cluster them together. Um, right? That would be an example of clustering. Um, association is a really good one. I'll talk about this in a later video, but things like Matzevec, where they did associations with word embedding. So they took chemical abstracts where you have all this knowledge typed up into paragraphs, and they associated those with things like materials properties. And now this becomes a clever feature. We'll talk about features in the next video. Now, in the semi-supervised learning type of machine learning, um, you, it's sort of in between. Instead of being fully uh, labeled and, and not being fully unlabeled, you might have partially labeled data sets, right? You could have a categorical target available variable, which you then want to either classify or cluster. Um, more about semi-supervised learning in a moment. Okay, and again, this has been done in material science. There's been synthesis procedures generated, but from data, from, from li literature articles. There's been clustering done to actually create things like databases. Um, and then you've got reinforcement learning. Now, in reinforcement learning, you could either have the categorical target variable or a target variable not available. This would lead to things like classification or control. And at the time that I made this, I put question marks because I wasn't aware of good examples in the field of uh, people using reinforcement learning for material science. I've since discovered a couple. There's been a few instances, but it's definitely not as heavily used as some of the others. Okay? So of these four types, you might think, okay, even that's a lot, but there's actually quite a bit more. There's a nice article I found here uh, on machinelearningmastery.com by this author, uh, who is it, Jason Brownlee. He does a good job of pointing out that in fact, there's quite a few, you could frame it in different ways and think of different types of machine learning that go even further than this. So the ones that he identifies are as follows. He's got his learning problems, that's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. We saw those on the previous slide. During his hybrid learning problem, he starts out with semi-supervised learning, which I showed you on the previous slide, but then he also talks about self-supervised and multi-instance learning. Under the category of statistical inference, he talks about inductive, deductive, and transductive learning. And finally, under different learning techniques, he talks about multitask, active learning, online learning, transfer learning, and ensemble learning. So let's dive into some of these, right? Let's start with, uh, we've already talked about sort of supervised learning, so let's jump into uh, unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning could include things like classification, clustering, density approximation, and projection. So what are these? I've already mentioned clustering. If you have a bunch of uncategorized uh, inputs, 
in this case, their shapes and colors, right? You could ask a machine learning algorithm to cluster them together. The blue stars end up in one cluster, the green squares, the purple circles, red triangles uh, get clustered, right? And so that would be one example where we have no idea of what these correspond to in terms of a target variable, but we can still cluster them and that could still be useful or meaningful. Um, they do this in photography regularly. You know, Google, you know, on, on your phone, we have these amazing devices that I can just type in on my Google Photos uh, caves and it will pull up all the pictures from my own database of caves because it has some labeled examples of caves it knows that that is what cave corresponds to so now it just has to cluster that type of image to any other images in my data set that are similar right which is pretty amazing how it can do that now another thing that unsupervised uh, machine learning can do for us is density estimation take a bunch of data points like this let's say you're measuring something in this case I don't know if they're measuring sepal weight and sepal length whatever that is right and you get a whole bunch of data points, it might be useful to know what are the regions on this plot where you're most likely to see your next point if you were to measure another point randomly, right? And you can get these density estimations. So you here see in this red curve, that's where it's sort of the most dense. And then as it goes from red towards blue, you're seeing these density waves uh, showing up and showing you where you're most likely to see additional data points. And that could be really valuable if you're predicting something, right? Another thing that you can do is visualization. Uh, and uns you don't have to have target variables to be able to visualize data in unique ways. Here's something from uh, research that we did a couple, you know, 10 years ago now, where we were looking at thermoelectric materials. Now, thermoelectrics are complex. You've got like many different properties that ultimately impact the final performance, ZT. So what we did is we made a tool that allowed you to plot on the X and Y parameters lots of different variables. In this case, I've chosen electrical resistivity on the x-axis. On the y-axis, I've got the y parameter is a Zabit coefficient. And then I've encoded the size of the marker to be correlated with ZT. So we're already storing three-dimensional information on a two-dimensional plot. And then you can color it different ways. So colors represent different material families. So you can see that in this way, we've encoded four uh, dimensions of information into a single two-dimensional plot. So lots of cool things that unsupervised learning can do to uh, achieve unique visualization, which might help a human brain interpret higher dimensional data, right? And then another thing you can do with unsupervised data is projection. Projection is something, a uh, similar thing, let's say you have high dimensional data and you want to project it into a plane where we can more see it and understand it as humans. One way to do that is with principal component analysis. And we're gonna do a future video on PCA, principal component analysis. But essentially what it does is it takes this high dimensional representation of data and it flattens it, it projects it along a plane whereby you get one dimension which is, you know, exaggerated and one which is minimized. So in other words, you're trying to make this look as linear as possible, right? Without losing information, you're trying to densify that information without losing information in the process. That would be an example of projection. So again, future videos coming up, but all of this falls under unsupervised learning. So what else do we got? Well, let's talk about reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is kind of like supervised learning, but it also has some key differences. Um, there's labeled data, just like with supervised learning, but there's a key difference. In reinforcement learning, you're allowing an agent, right, the machine learning algorithm, to operate in an environment, and it must learn to operate by using feedback from that environment, right? So the most you know, exciting examples of this, in my in my opinion, are the games that are out there and how uh, computers are now beating the best human players in these games. So on the left, you see a map from StarCraft. On the right, you see a map from League of Legends, where heaven knows I've spent plenty of hours of my life, right? And in these games, it doesn't matter if you haven't played them before. The basic concept is the same. If you're on the blue team, this is your base, this big crystal. And, and if you're on the red team, this is your base. And the goal is to destroy the other person's base. And you have five members on each team so there's five people playing on this side five people playing on this side and you know you can't just like take all five people and march right down the middle and try and destroy it because there's these defensive structures which would kill your units early in the game you're just not strong enough but as the game works you can get stronger over time you can earn gold for example to buy items to strengthen your characters and you get gold by doing lots of different things you can kill neutral monsters or these little mini bad guys or you can kill the other enemy players or they destroy their towers all these things will earn you money to strengthen your characters and because it's a five on five and there's other big global objectives to worry about, like in these big pits here, there are special global objectives which can buff your whole team or debuff the other team. It gets really complicated. This is not something that you can just, even if you wanted to tell a computer, hey, here's the best strategy. You should start by doing, you know, X, Y, Z. It 
probably wouldn't work. Like humans try that, it's really hard. So instead, what we do with reinforcement learning is we allow the agent to just play. We allow it to try different things and we give it feedback. So one feedback that you could use is the overall gold at any given time. At any point in the game, you could keep track of how much gold your team has or you know other metrics, you know, how many kills does each of your key characters have, you know. You could keep track of those things and then it could learn over time that hey, when I was able to accumulate lots of gold, I was able to get closer to destroying the enemy base, or maybe I was able to, right? And when other games, when it didn't focus on that, it did really poorly and it didn't defeat it. Crazy as it sounds, and they didn't think this would ever happen, especially a five versus five game, they never thought an AI would be able to beat humans, but now they are beating them regularly, which is incredible. Not just in League of Legends, but in StarCraft. It, the original was AlphaGo and you know chess. Uh, but so this has become really popular and again, it's all about learning from data that becomes available based off of the choices they make. Now this is different than supervised learning because even though it's labeled data, it's different because in this case there is no fixed data set. It's not like there's one data set that everybody uses because every game you play and if you keep on playing more games, you're augmenting the data set and you're doing it based off of probably prior decisions. After you played the last game, you're like, ooh, when I built a bunch of tanks instead of a balanced team, I got smoked, right? So maybe I need to choose to have just a couple tanks and a couple of other characters, right? Um, and then the other big uh, difference is that the feedback might be delayed or noisy, right? You don't know right away if earning gold is going to help you in that game. It might be delayed, right? And so that's different than supervised learning where you have the t input and the output target immediately. Or it might be noisy, right? What one strategy that works one time might not work the next time, and so there's it introduces some uncertainty. In any case, this is reinforcement learning. Now I've given you some examples from video games, but it's actually being used in material science and chemistry pretty regularly now. They're actually using it for the design of custom molecules and materials, um, and we'll have some future videos on that uh, later on. All right, so that is our instances of learning problems. Now let's shift gears to these hybrid learning problems. We'll start with these semi-supervised that I alluded to previously. So again, semi-supervised, as I mentioned before, you have some labeled data, but it's typically a small fraction of your total data. So you have lots and lots of data and only a small fraction is labeled. So for example here, you've got these labeled data points, you know, circles and triangles, and you've got all these other uh, data points which are unlabeled. So what do you do with that is the question that semi-supervised learning asks. Well, there's a couple things you can do. For example, you could cluster your data and then label it. So you could apply clustering, an unsupervised learning technique, and all of a sudden you've got all this data clustered here and all of this data clustered here. And then you could say, well, all of these data points are near the ones that have this label. So maybe I could label all of these as being blue squares and I could label all of these as being green triangles. That would be an example of cluster and then label. But there's other approaches. For example, on this one, say that you've got labeled data. So you use that labeled data to make a model. That would be supervised learning, right? So now that you've got a model, you can take new inputs and you can run them through your model to label them. That's supervised learning. So now you've got this, we'll call it pseudo labeled data because it's not truly labeled. It's not like you know the ground truth that definitely this is orange and this is blue and this is orange, right? You just think it is because your model tends to do pretty good. And so if it thinks though, it's probably pretty close. You can then use the pseudo labeled data along with your real labeled data. And now you've got a whole bunch of data and you can build a model off of that. Now, if that seems a little bit skeezy to you, like, hey, wait a minute, we're introducing erroneous possible data how is our overall model going to be better? It can be better if your initial model is pretty good, so you're not introducing a lot of error, and if there's lots of data here. That uh, larger amount of data can overcome the error that's introducing by having slightly incorrect data in that data set. So pretty cool. That's an example of semi-supervised learning. Okay. Now, self-supervised learning, it is trickier. So it's unsupervised learning. So there's not a target label, but it's framed in a way that it thinks it's a supervised learning problem. So what, are, what am I talking about? Well, as I've got written here, it says supervised learning algorithms. These are used to solve an alternate or pretext task, the result of which is a model or representation that can be used in the solution of the original or actual modeling problem. So good examples of this are things like colorization, right? If you start with a black and white, image, how do you know what the correct one is, right? You don't have the image. Maybe it's something that was taken back before we had color photographs, and yet you've got this image. So how do you actually turn it into the final image and know if you got it right? It's not a target 
that is labeled and so this is unsupervised learning but you can frame it in a way where it's close to uh, supervised learning and you do that by taking lots and lots of other pictures which you have examples of their real colored image and their grayscale one and so you learn what typically a picture like this would look like if it was colorized and then you apply that to your one without the target label and you end up with something that's colorized in it depending if you've done this correctly then the self-supervised learning can produce something that looks really good another example of this is in painting let's say we take this image here that's the input and there are these sections of it which are we're gonna hide them okay the green means that you don't show those portions to the computer but you ask the computer to try and fill in these green boxes right so the actual target if you knew what it actually would look like would be here but what is the model output might look like this so it's not perfect but it's pretty impressive. Again, again, the idea is uh, if it didn't know what the target ought to be, it would learn from many, many other images of rooms with computers and desks in it, and it would start to recognize that, well, probably these are the types of things that are in it. So again, self-supervised learning. It's unsupervised learning because you don't have the target, but it's framed in a way that looks like a supervised learning problem. Pretty clever, okay? Um, you've got things like multi-instance learning, and this is when you have supervised learning, but here you have bags of samples that are labeled. Remember with supervised learning, you had an individual you know, observation and it had a labeled target value. So if you had, for example, a metal composition, maybe it has a metal strength associated with it. Well, here it's different because now we have bags of data. You lump lots of data together in bags. So for example, let's say that we're, we're looking at members of the perovskite crystal structure bag, right? Any material scientist, you're familiar with the perovskite crystal structure. It's this type of uh, crystal structure. But we also refer to a broader class of materials as perovskites, right? Not just the original OG perovskite, like this guy over here. We would call many of these things in the perovskite family. So that means that they all contain some shared attributes, right? There must be something about all these images, if we call them all perovskites, that makes them perovskites. But there's probably some things that are unshared. So just looking at it, you could say, well, they have different types of atoms. This one has red atoms, this has purple, this one has orange, right? So maybe it's not like the types of atoms that makes something a perovskite or not. But looking a little bit closer, you could say, ah, but I see that there's this octahedral building block that seems to be present in all of these, right? And you can see that it's shared the same way. It's typically shared along these corners, right? That seems important. And then you've got these other atoms in the centers. So you could learn what is it about these what is it the essential attribute to be a member of the perovskite bag, right? And that would be an example of multi-instant learning. And then once you learn that, maybe you could identify future perovskites or you could use these to make predictions based off of average values of perovskites. But this is an instance where you have groups of materials that are labeled, but you don't know exactly all the instances that make them in that members of that group, okay? Now let's talk about inference, right? Statistical inference was another category. And inference just means that you are reaching an outcome or making a decision. So if you've read Sherlock Holmes, I love to read Sherlock Holmes books. He always talked about deductive inference and inductive inference. Um, and I, I'm not sure I understood it as a child, but as I'm getting older, it's making more sense to me. And here's, uh, some, here's a nice description of these things, okay? Let me move this over. So inductive versus deductive are learning opposites, right? So inductive learning is learning general rules from specific examples. So if you're a little kid and you get in a fight with somebody who's a lot bigger than you, that was a one-time event, but you probably learned from that a general rule that if you pick on somebody who's a lot bigger than you, you're probably gonna lose that fight. That's an example of learning a general rule from a few specific examples. That's inductive learning. It provided, um, you had hard evidence and you had to back out the general rule from that hard evidence of a specific case. Now, deductive learning is the exact opposite of that. It's learning specifics from some general rules. So if you have some general rules and you can learn, you know, uh, the exact opposite, so, you could say the general rule is that you shouldn't pick a fight with people that are bigger than you. And then you see somebody that's bigger than you, you could say, I shouldn't pick a fight with that person because the general rule says I'm gonna lose that, right? So it's the exact opposite, okay? Now, transductive learning is predicting from a specific example to a specific example. So maybe you got in a fight with somebody and you didn't learn anything. You didn't learn that that person was bigger or stronger or whatever. You just saw another person. You're like, no, I'm not gonna, that looks similar to the one that I've seen before. So I'm not gonna fight that person. That would be transductive learning. In terms of the decision-making, the models look a little bit like this. You've got your examples. Those are the case studies, 
you have the decision, right? The values at the function at the point of interest, right? And then you've got this approximating function. So for example, you fought with somebody, your approximating function was like, oh, if I fight somebody bigger than me, I'm gonna lose that fight. And therefore, my deduction says, I'm not gonna take this next fight or I will take this next fight based off of whether that person's bigger or smaller than you, I guess. Whereas transduction is just saying, from this last example, I'm gonna to decide to do something else with this next example without having learned some overarching lesson. I'm just gonna say it's similar or it's dissimilar to it. So uh, inductive learning, the model is learning these general rules. Uh, we draw conclusions from, about the future from past examples. And this is basically fitting the machine learning model. That's inductive learning. Whereas deductive learning is this top-down reasoning that seeks all premises to be met before you come to some conclusion. So you've already come up with this overarching, you know, uh, you know, premise, right? And now you're making sure that all these categories fit within that premise before you make your decision. So if inductive learning is fitting a machine learning model, then deductive learning is using the machine learning model now to make an inference, to make a decision. It's running a new scenario through your machine learning model and saying, you know, fight or don't fight or whatever your example might be. And then transductive learning is cool. Um, you can get better predictions, especially with few labeled points, um, but you get no predictive model built, which means that every time you want to make a new prediction, you have to run the full calculation again. And a good example of this comes from the Wikipedia page. So here they show these different clusters with some of these labeled A, some this one labeled B, and a couple of these labeled C. So in terms of labeled data, you don't have a high fraction of labeled data. This would be a very uh, sparsely labeled data set, right? Now, if you used uh, traditional machine learning examples, supervised or unsupervised here, you're going to do pretty poorly because an algorithm might say, what do I do with this data point? Well, you could say it's closest to A, so I'm going to label it A, right? Or maybe this one here is closest to C, so I'm going to label it C. However, if you were instead to use a transductive approach and say, I'm going to look at all these data points, and when I look at all of them all together, I see that all of these are in a cluster, and it includes B, and not A or C. This cluster only includes A, this cluster only includes C. Using transductive inference, I can assume that all of these are B, all of these are A, and all of these are C. And you're gonna be more accurate in the limit of small data. So transductive has some advantages. The downside is that there's a new data point added. I don't have a model that can instantly assign it to A, B, or C. I would again have to look at all the data points and say, huh, well, I think that it should be you know, whatever, based off of how it compares with all the other data points that are available right now. So those are different examples of inductive, deductive, and transductive learning that you'll see in machine learning, okay? All right, lastly, we've got different learning techniques, multitask learning, active, online, transfer, and ensemble learning. So let's dive into some of these. Well, multitask learning is when you fit a model to, uh, of a single data set to multiple related tasks or problems, right? Uh, so training the models overall to do multitask, it needs to be more than just more efficient. It's not like you're just saving time saying, hey, instead of just predicting melting point, we're gonna predict melting point and boiling point, not just because it's more efficient, but because it should overall improve your performance, okay? And there's reasons why it could improve your performance, particularly if those two phenomena are related, right? Uh, but it, one example where it could be useful is, let's imagine that you have a data set and it's only partially labeled with melting points, but it's fully labeled with boiling points. So you can build a really good model for the boiling points, right, if you wanted to alone, and a really crappy one for the melting points because it, it's very poorly labeled. Or you could train them together. The exact same compound has both a boiling point and a melting point. And those two are typically going to have some relationship, which could be learned, the difference between the boiling point and the melting point, right? So that's the idea behind multitask learning, is that maybe you have one database, uh, one in your database, one target is well labeled and the other one is not. And so they use this phrase of borrowing statistical strength from the tasks with lots of data and sharing that statistical strength with the tasks that would otherwise have very limited data. Um, so another good advantage of this is that this improves your model generalizability. Model generalizability is basically saying when you're done building your model and training it and you go to use it in the real world, how accurate is it? Um, if it's generalizable, it's gonna be generalizable to the real world, to other problems, right? Um, and if you've sort of hyper-focused it on training data for a single task, sometimes you can do something called overfitting, which we'll talk about later, um, which is poor generalizability, essentially. So um, 
this has been done in material science quite a bit. Here example from a paper by uh, Rampi Ramprasad, you see lots of different data sets, you know, having glassy transition and melting points of polymers. So they made a joint data set and with their model they were able to do multitask predictions of glassy transition and melting point where maybe these were different sized or different reasons. And I think they predicted other things as well, but they were able to do better by combining these predictions together than doing them separately alone. So that's multitask learning. Um, active learning is a really cool concept, especially for material science. The concept is this. It allows for efficient learning because um, you're adding new data points in an intentional way. So this makes a lot of sense when you have a small data set and adding new data is either really expensive or slow or hard for some reason. So this is material science, right? Every time I tell my grad student, go and measure some new compounds so our database gets larger, that could be a month, right? That could be like a week to make the thing, a week to characterize it, a week to measure properties, a week to get the data entered somewhere, right? It could be a really slow process. So what active learning allows us to do is, uh, here's the definition, it says it's a technique where the model is able to query an oracle, they use this terminology, an oracle, like something that knows the truth, during the learning process in order to resolve ambiguity during the learning process. So this is so cool. It's basically saying like, I trained my first, um, I had 100 data points to start with, and I trained a model, and I had lots of questions still. Like my model wasn't great, it was getting some things wrong. So you're allowing the model to ask an oracle, somebody who knows, additional questions it says, hey, when I was training these, I was getting the carbides wrong. So I'm going to ask you a bunch of new questions about carbides and increase my knowledge about carbides is basically kind of the idea here. So you're sequentially adding more data, but you can do so in a way to say minimize uncertainty, right? To make it so the thing that you know the least about uh, gets minimized, right? Uh, or the, yeah. Anyways, so this is the idea behind active learning. Um, it's well suited to data sets that are small, when generating new data is expensive or tricky. Um, it's a very efficient learner because you basically don't waste time gathering data on a concept you already understand. If you already understand how chain length affects boiling point or melting point, then you can ask for data uh, about something else. If you think you've already got a good handle on that, you won't waste your time, as it were, your effort gathering more data on that topic because you already understand it. Um, this is similar to semi-supervised learning, except that new ground truth labels are generated instead of relying on the models to label this unlabeled data. So if you remember back to our uh, semi-supervised, we basically said, oh, we've got this labeled data and this unlabeled data. In semi-supervised, we used a model, a supervised learning machine model to predict the labels. Here, instead of doing that, in active learning, I would go and in the laboratory, we'd consult an oracle, meaning I'd tell a graduate student to go make these new properties and measure them. So we just increase our labeled data set. Instead of just having this pseudo labeled data set where we're pretty sure these are right, we would move some of these over to the labeled data column where we know that they're correct because we measured the ground truth. We measured something that we're confident of well within whatever uncertainty that measurement has, okay? So um, this can do some cool things. I love to look at papers where they've used this nicely. For example, here, I think this was a paper where they were looking at um, piezoelectric strain. So when you apply an electric field, you cause a piezoelectric crystal to strain, like deform a little bit. So what they were after was new materials that had really high strain when you applied a field. And they had this clever approach where they said, okay, we could just pick new compounds at random. And over time, they picked a bunch of things at random and its overall performance was bad. Right, it basically didn't do great. Um, or you could prioritize exploration, meaning we're gonna prioritize finding unexpected materials, or you could prioritize these blue ones, these darker blue ones, um, things that look like they're gonna perform really well. Now the benefit of exploitation, things that look like they're gonna do well, is that you might get high performance, but you might do so in boring systems. Whereas exploration might explore new interesting systems but it might do poorly. And that's kind of what we see here. And then they had a trade-off where they did some mixture of these two. And I can't remember in the paper how exactly they implemented this, but they did a trade-off. And overall, they ended up finding the best overall performance over time, which is pretty cool. So you typically will see these sort of things where sequentially, as you add more data in a thoughtful, rational way, you're getting rational improvement. So this makes a lot of sense for material science where we have small data sets and it's so hard to get new data. This is a pretty, cle pretty clever uh, type of, or yeah, technique of machine learning, I guess we'd call it. Um, then you've got online learning. Online learning is, is different than active learning. And it took me a minute to realize what the difference is, right? So it involves continually updating the model after each data point acquisition. Now that sounds like active learning, right? We had a certain data set here to start with. We did iteration one where we added new data, 
and now our model is a little bit smarter. But this is different. In this case, the data itself typically is sequential. Maybe it's a time series, right? Maybe you're measuring grain size over time. And so that data is tied to one another, right? It's not just that there's, there was a batch and then later on there was another batch and then later on there was another batch. That's different. That's not sequential data. This works really well with sequential data where it's tied together either on time or whatever, okay? Um, so online learning involves using the data that's available and then updating the model directly before a prediction is required or after the last observation is made. So again, I mentioned this is well suited to sequential data sets where perhaps that data is changing over time. Um, think of like shoe sales. Maybe you're thinking like this, the price of a shoe over time. As it becomes popular, maybe some celebrity wears it. All of a sudden, that thing could spike in value. Um, and then maybe it goes down over time. So online learning allows us in real time to capture what's happening and make predictions based off of it, right? Now, something that's problematic is this can be subject to something called catastrophic inference or catastrophic forgetting. So let's do an example. Let's show you what this might look like. Let's say that we had data that looked like this, right? So whatever your X value is and your Y value is, let's imagine that your data was doing something like this, where it was kind of like oscillating but then it had like some funny behavior like this, okay? So if you did supervised learning, what would supervised learning do? Well, it's gonna have a hard time fitting this maybe because one thing it could learn is what these oscillations are. It could learn these pretty easily maybe, but it's gonna get something like that wrong probably, right? Um, and it, I don't know what it would do with this beginning section, right? That's going to be confusing to it as well. So one thing that online learning can do is that you can look at smaller batches at a time. Like maybe you're looking at like this batch of data at a time. And so when it's making its predictions, it's saying, well, it's been going up, right? We've had this upward trend, so it's more likely to do that. And as you sequentially take this data, it can slowly learn like, oh, we're starting to go down, right? So the problem is if you only are ever looking on a window that size, what you're not learning, and this is the catastrophic inference, right? This is the catastrophic forgetting. You're forgetting the fact that this is like an, an oscillating pattern, right? Which can be problematic. You're, you're not learning, uh, whereas if you looked at like a bigger window of space, you would see that oscillation and you'd learn that maybe it's sinusoidal or, or whatever else, right? You could, be you could be forgetting that if you shrink your data size down. But on the other hand, if you have a small window, you could, you'd get this right. You'd say it's still going up, it's still going up, it's starting to go down. Like it would do a better job of predicting things like that. So there's a trade-off, right? One is more nimble and responsive to slight changes in your data, right? But it's also more likely to forget, right? Experience classical forgetting the fact that this thing oscillates. So online learning is a really cool um, area of machine learning in my opinion right now. Because there's a lot of just unanswered questions on how this would be useful for machine learning, right? Uh, for material science. Think of what sort of time series data we have. Maybe you're measuring a sensor as gases are evolved or not, right? You're looking very much for maybe slight changes, but you're also looking at baseline changes, right? The baseline performance. Maybe you're looking at time series data of microstructure, right? How does grain size evolve or pores evolve or how does defects move in a material? This would be a really interesting application of online learning. But again, the idea is that in real time, you've got sequential data and you can choose what portion of that data you, you use to update your model in real time. Very, very cool concept. Um, you've got transfer learning. So transfer learning is when you take a trained model for some task and then you, after you train it, you apply it to another task. So this is different than multitask. Multitask is we're going to train both of them at the same time. Transfer learning is you take one task, you train it, and then a completely different task, you say, hey, all or part of this model might be useful for this other maybe related uh, task, right? So let's say you got these two tasks. We assume that many factors that explain the variations in task one are relevant to the variations that we need to explain the subsequent task, right? So where do we use this? Well, it's well suited for instance where one task has a lot of data, but a second task only has limited data. Um, and again, it's done sequentially rather than the same time, which makes it different than multitask. So we've done this in one of our works. We actually did it. We were looking at predicting band gap and we were interested in both in DFT band gap. So from say the materials project or a flow, there's lots of DFT calculated band gaps. But we're also interested in experimental band gaps where there's typically a very small, much small, smaller data set for uh, experimental data. Now there's a well-known problem with DFT calculated band gaps that depending on which functional, you know, voodoo you're using in the DFT world, 
they tend to underestimate, right? The experimental is typically higher and it gets uh, under or over, I can't remember which, what this is saying, let's see, for four, it thinks it should be four, but it's actually underestimating, yeah, so it's underestimating the band gap. Um, that's a very common problem with DFT. But you typically have way more DFT examples to learn from. So one example of transfer learning is, what if you used transfer learning to train models to learn how band gap is related to chemistry, basically, from lots and lots of examples, and then you use transfer learning to learn how, how DFT data differs from experimental data. Basically, you're using transfer learning to learn this small difference between them. So we did an example of that and it actually worked really well to transfer the learning of chemistry. And then you only have to learn in your second scenario what's the difference between DFT and experimental by using that pre-trained model. Okay? Um, another, uh, I think the final one, yeah, is ensemble learning is another technique. And ensemble learning is when you just rely on multiple models for training your data, and then you combine the results together from multiple models. So again, um, think of this like in, when it's election season, we always have like the real clear average of the polls, right? Because you got like your Gallup and your you know ABC and Politico and whatever different polls. And any one of those polls might be a little bit wackadoodle. So we often rely on a poll of polls. We just average all the polls, and then that real clear average is typically better than if you relied on any one of them alone, right? It's a safer bet. This is kind of like that. When it comes to machine learning, there's lots of different models that we could use. Uh, as I will show you in the next slide, there's linear, there's you know whatever, there's, there's ensemble methods like random forest, there's all sorts of different things. Um, and these all kind of have their pros and cons, which we'll get to in the next slide. So the idea behind ensemble learning is try them all. Try a bunch of different models. And then when you're done, the output of those individual models can be the inputs to a new machine learning model. And it can figure out how much it should care about the different individual models. So for example, here we did again with um, uh, band gap. We were making predictions. So in one case, we did SVR, uh, gradient boosted regression, that's a type of ensemble technique, and random forest regression. And we just took all three of these models that were trained off of you know, our data, we sent them into a meta learner, meaning a machine learning model of machine learning models, in this case it was a support vector machine, and we had predictions. And we compared that with lots of different other ones where we had only a single model, or two, or three, plus one that included DFT, all these different schemes, and overall we found that Meta learning or ensemble learning was a powerful tool to improve your overall prediction effect efficacy because these different types of models sort of have different strengths and weaknesses, and we can combine the strengths and minimize the weaknesses by having an ensemble learning framework, which is pretty cool. All right, so we're almost done. Let me just say that there are loads of different machine learning algorithms out there available. In future videos, we're going to go one by one through, I think, all of these. We will talk about ensemble techniques. We'll talk about support vector machines, about Bayesian techniques, linear models, neural networks. And you see the lots of different specific examples of all those, gradient boosted, ADA boost, you know, Gaussian, uh, you know, SVRs, ridge regression, all these different things. There's lots of examples. But generally speaking, in my opinion, here's the sort of pros and cons or the key notes to know about the different types of machine learning algorithms available. When we're talking about ensemble techniques, these tend to be fast learners. They tend to be efficient because we can parallelize the calculations so that we can do it in, C in parallel. Um, they, they do well with nonlinear problems. They have um, a problem, a very severe problem with extrapolation, meaning going beyond the 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 uh, input bounds, right? If you're if your training data only goes from zero to one hundred in your categories, but you're trying to predict something that you should have like one hundred and ten, it's going to not be able to do that or have a very hard problem with it. A benefit is you can get something called feature weights. We'll talk about features in the next video, but feature weights, pulling those out, knowing what fraction of the weights correspond to the predictions is really valuable. Um, with support vector machines, you have the big benefit of kernel selection, sometimes called the kernel trick, and we'll talk about that in a future video, but it's a way to, um, yeah, it's a way to capture complications in your data in a very clever way. Um, it has good metrics. It, it tends to be a high-performing uh, algorithm. It has the hinge loss, um, something that is a tunable parameter. And then this scales poorly. So as you get to really large data or lots of parameters, this tends to scale poorly. It becomes really slow. Um, Bayesian learning, Bayesian statistics, is a really cool approach. It works well with small data. It focuses on uncertainty. And so uncertainty is quantified throughout, which is really valuable. This can be well suited for physics-informed studies because you use something called priors, where you have to guess something about how the data is going to behave ahead of time. 
you measure it and then you update your model. You say, oh, I thought it would do this, but I've learned that it did something different. And I'm going to update my model in response to that. So that lends itself well to physics informed studies where we have an idea based off of physics of how things ought to perform. And then we can just update that model. You've got linear models. These are very easy to interpret, which is a big strength of them, that you kind of understand what's going on behind the, the code. It's easy to see, oh, this is where the prediction is coming from. Easy to interpret. They are fast, um, but they are not suitable for many problems. If you have a linear problem, you'll do great. If you have a nonlinear problem, this is not going to do well. Um, and then you've got your neural networks. So these are fast. They can be run on a GPU, which allows them to be really fast. Um, they can achieve what's called feature-free engineering. And again, our next video will talk about features, but that's a potentially big advantage. Avoiding features could be a big advantage. Um, you can do really high accuracy predictions. Uh, they tend to do really, really well. They are a full on black box though, very hard to interpret. The model just spits out a prediction and it's very hard to point to it and say, here's what the model's thinking as it were, right? Here's why it made that prediction. It's hard to do that in a neural network. And they are prone to overfitting, which again, we'll talk about in a later video, but that's when your model um, is focusing too much on the training data and it's not generalizable to the real world, which might have slightly different distribution of data. Um, neural networks can just memorize your data. And then when you see something that's not the exact same as your input data, it's like, it's going to get it wrong. That's overfitting. Um, so in our next video, we will dive into featureization. See you next time.